Right, good afternoon, everybody. We'll start straight away. Um, I'd like to welcome Mauro Petrizione, who is the Director General of the DG for Climate Action in the European Commission. Um, he has a long history in the European Commission and was Deputy Director General of DG Trade. And in that role would have been Chief Negotiator on CETA with Canada and also the EU-Japan <coughs> partnership arrangement on trade. And I think that type of approach that considers the economic transition we have to face into and the business transition we have to face into will be quite important over the next number of years. Um, I think people might have picked up this morning that the European Climate <coughs> Foundation released a marking system on the National Energy and Climate Plans for some European states. In it, Ireland came out with a mark of 38%, uh, which shows the type of challenge that we face. A separate important piece was that we are not alone. So 38% saw us seventh in the rankings and about 10% above the European average. I think what that means is that there are common challenges that we face and we must work with other economies as we develop the types of solutions that we need to take on over the next number of years. The European Union will play a very important part of that, whether it's accelerating access to low interest finance for the type of building works, both small scale and large scales we need to engage in, whether it is increased regulation around electric and low emission vehicles, or their incentivization to ensure a just transition and perhaps an identification of those industries that will find it harder to transition to where we need to get to. Uh, without any further delay, uh, Mauro will cover today the EU strategic long-term vision for a climate-neutral economy by 2050. I would just remind people that the initial presentation and speech is open and on the record, but the dialogue that will follow and the question and answer sessions that will follow is under Chatham House rules, which means you can use the information provided, but not attribute it to an individual or an organisation. So with that, Mauro, I'd like you to take the stand and... Jim, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and let me uh, thank also the Institute for this invitation. Um, I was long in replying, but uh, I'm happy that we managed to find to find a day. Uh, look, I'll start by explaining what do we face and what we're doing now before we go to what we should do later. But I'll try to keep it short, but it is a complicated issue. I mean, I've had a look at the debate that Ireland is having on climate change, and I don't think that I need to go into a lot of detail to explain to you the seriousness of, of the situation. Um, you're one of the few, two countries so far, who actually declared a climate emergency, um, which is a new concept and a very interesting one uh, in terms of responding in a, in a more... Uh, obvious and, and, uh, uh, and loud manner to what we are hearing uh, uh, around the world and uh, in, in the streets of our cities. But let me just recall a few facts. Uh, in spite of this seriousness, in spite of the gravity of these concerns, we still all face everywhere, in all countries, uh, in all cities, in all institutions, the concerns about do we really have to do these things? How far do we have to go? How fast do we have to go there? Can we afford it? Uh, is it going to cost us jobs? Is it going to cost us too much for the economy, etc.? There's no denying that. And uh, those concerns cannot be ignored. Some of them are less justified than others, uh, but you cannot ignore them altogether. So that's the first situation where we are now beginning to enter into an era of contradiction between a real justified uh, fear of what the future uh, has in store for us and uh, deep-seated resistance to the changes that are required uh, to avoid that future. I think it's the political contradiction of our days. And uh, our job as civil servants is to try and offer avenues the political decision makers to resolve that contradiction. The, the cost of climate change, of the impact, is becoming obvious to everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's an economic cost, uh, damage costs money, uh, fires cost lives, floods cost lives. So I think it's quite obvious that 
to everybody that the situation is unsustainable, it's going to get worse. If you think that uh, worldwide we are at 1, 1.1 degree of global warming on average, in Europe we are at 1.6. Uh, and Europe is one of the most vulnerable continents because don't forget we are a meteorological exception. Thanks to the Gulf Stream, um, if you uh, were living at the same latitude as Dublin, anywhere else in the world, you would have icebergs in your garden. Um, same where I live in, 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 in Belgium. So we are more fragile than others. Um, and we're beginning to see uh, the impact. But what a lot of people don't focus on is our economy. That same economy that we wish to protect, that same economy that gives us prosperity and jobs is not resilient. And uh, you know, start with the basics, the impact of global warming on energy use. Uh, you can see that in many countries, the consumption of electricity for cooling in the hot periods is increasing dramatically, and we don't know where to find it. But you find some, you know, things which were totally unpredictable. I was in Finland uh, a couple of months ago, and I discovered that in Finland you can no longer absolutely rely on hydropower because the uh, pattern of uh, the rains doesn't f no longer fills the dams as predictably as before. It's not that they have to renounce hydropower, but before you could calculate it mathematically every year, you would know how much power you, you get from your dams, well, you, can't, you can no longer do that in a place like Finland. Uh, same in other countries. Uh, transport, it's very easy to ignore the fact that the permafrost is softening and therefore you can no longer have roads for heavy duty trucks in Canada or in Russia. It's not a situation for any of us. But the fact that in, on the Rhine you can no longer load barges in full and you can load them uh, uh, up to a third maximum, and therefore that triples the number of barges you need, and then probably also the cost of your goods and the cost of your insurance, etc. And these are, you know, these examples are multiplying everywhere. So the economy as we know it uh, is also fragile towards climate change, and that is an important consideration. puts in in, con in, in context the idea, you know, why are we doing this? Can we afford it? The real question is. Can we afford not to deal with climate change? And even from a purely you know, basic economic point of view, we cannot afford not to deal with this problem. Um, nor do I need to explain to, uh, to an audience in Ireland what climate change can do to agriculture um, and to the, uh, to the pattern of crops and to the pattern of rains uh, and, and what you need to do to maintain an, an agricultural society. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, in Europe, we have effectively decoupled uh, emissions from economic growth. Between 1990 and 2017, we have reduced emissions by 22%, while our GDP grew by 58%. Um, we are now proposing by 2030 to double the rate of reduction, uh, to have a reduction of another uh, 23%. Uh, in 13 years, so in half the time. Um, in 2014, this is on the basis of the decision we took in 2014 that we should achieve at least minus 40% uh, greenhouse gas emission by 2030. Um, we have the Paris Agreement. We now have a what's called a nationally determined contribution where we have committed internationally to this at least minus 40%. And in 2019, we completed a five years legislative program uh, with uh, 2030 as the objective. We've reformed the emission trading system. Uh, many of you would know the shortcoming of the, the initial system. Uh, when I uh, took this job 14 months ago, the uh, price of a ton of carbon was around five, six euros. Um, in spite of that, European industry had gotten the message and in the past 10, 15 years have done massive reduction in energy consumption uh, through energy efficiency, even with existing technologies, 
which incidentally has had a very clear positive impact on their productivity, their competitiveness, their ability to keep jobs in Europe, because we haven't seen the threat and massive delocalization towards countries like China. We have seen cases, but the massive trend that we all fear has not materialized. One of the reasons was because the signal given to industry that climate policy would require greater energy efficiency has been absorbed even at very low prices. In the meantime, we've reformed the system. The reform has started with the first element this year and will be in full in 2021. And the market is already anticipating that, and the price of a ton of carbon is now above 20 euros. And when the new reform is uh, operating in full, we expect those prices to continue to, uh, to go up between now and 2030. We have completed work on the energy union, uh, a renewable energy target of 32%. We're about, at about 17 Europe-wide uh, these days, and we have an objective of 20% uh, in 2020. Um, energy efficient target of 32.5%. Uh, a massive exercise of planning at member states level. The plans that uh, Jim was referring to are plans which have been introduced by a new regulation on governance of the energy union. Member states have produced draft national energy and climate plans uh, uh, between the end of last year and the beginning of this year. Those drafts are public. You can find them certainly on the Commission website, most likely on the website of the different governments. Um, commission will issue recommendations in this respect, and Member States will finalise those plans by the end of the year. That's never been done in Europe before. It's not to say that planning alone fixes your problem, but you start from planning, and uh, this exercise also fits with the kind of debate that we see happening, not only in Ireland, but in most Member States, how do we plan ahead for uh, this transition towards a, a more climate-friendly economy? CO2 standards for cars, uh, an obligation to reduce emission by 37% for cars by 2030, 31% for vans, 30% for heavy-duty trucks. For the sectors not covered by the um, ETS, a 30% target uh, Europe-wide, national targets determined partly on the on relative wealth and partly on um, consideration of cost efficiency. Uh, the target for Ireland is also 30, happens to be also 30%. And for the land, the land use sector, uh, an obligation to maintain, at least maintain, our carbon sink in balance uh, and, and preferably to, to enhance it. And when it comes to international action, We've started the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We achieved the so-called Katowice rule book last year in Poland, which gives you the transparency rule, the common metrics, all we need, the processes, all we need to measure what all countries are doing and to compare what they're doing on the basis of the old maxim, what can't be measured can't be managed. Uh, so this is where we are. I'm sorry I'm going very fast, but uh, there is a lot uh, on the table here. Yeah. So what are we going to do next? Uh, we started from the IPCC report on the impact of 1.5 degrees global warming. And that report clearly shows that even that impact, which is a lot worse than what we are experiencing now, um, is, uh, is going to be very expensive and very difficult to cope with. Not respecting the Paris Agreement target well below two degrees and trying to stay as close as possible to 1.5 uh, increases the damage and the cost exponentially. Uh, so we started from that report, we, um, which also says that in order to, to achieve that, the world has to be climate neutral, net zero, sometime between 2060 and 2080. In our analysis, we take 2070 as an arbitrary median point, but that's the range that the IPCC report gives you, which also means that developed nations have to uh, reach neutrality as early as possible in the 2050s. Um, otherwise, there will not be a knock-on effect on emerging economies and developing countries. The current collective ambition of countries in the world who have committed to the Paris Agreement 
lead us by the end of the century to something between three and four degrees of global warming. Um, so somebody has to start the process of uh, uh, going down towards the, um, the Paris Agreement goals. What we have put on the table is that Europe should be the one to start. Uh, why us first? First, because we can do it. Europe is the only place in the world where the political conditions, the awareness of the population, and the technologies to achieve the transition are all present. Um, if you look at the United States, technologies are there too. Those who believe in climate change in the US believe as pass passionately as Europeans do. Uh, but they don't, they're not a majority. The country is profoundly split. Uh, and it's very hard to say which side has a majority. And the same in, in, in many other countries. Secondly, we must do it because otherwise nobody else does it. And if nobody does it, we will suffer like everybody else. And as I said earlier, we'll probably be among the first to suffer. Uh, because if global warming gets to the point of altering the function of the Gulf Stream, um, the situation in Europe would precipitate. So we have, this is not a question of moral obligation, it's in our old-fashioned good self-interest to trigger this transformation if nobody else is prepared to do it. Thirdly, we also have some more base interest in doing it. This requires a deep transformation of the economy. It requires developing and deploying new technologies. It requires new services, new business models, new and better ways to run our economies, who gets first gains the most. It's a very well-known principle of international economics. Uh, we have the ability uh, to do that. Uh, we also have to compare this with the counterfactual. What if we don't do it? Our current economic model isn't a fantastic success. If you, pros if you project it over the next few decades. Uh, we are not doing too badly, but there are problems, and I'm sure that you could list a long list of problems in Ireland, and I hear a long list of problems everywhere uh, in Europe. We are under competitive pressure from uh, emerging economies. We are losing our technological lead. We still do not have any resources. We are heavily dependent on energy mostly from countries who are not particularly friendly to us. Uh, so there is an element of independence as well as security of our energy supply. So it's not as if continuing this model, as if uh, nothing happened, would make us particularly successful, particularly happy. Our industrial fabric is in many ways obsolete. It requires massive investment in modernization. So money will have to be spent. Our energy needs are increasing. There is a need for a massive investment in our energy system. In any event, around 2% of our GDP. Same investment in a clean energy system would cost us, according to our projection, around 2.8% of our GDP. It's a big difference. Uh, but it's not a difference between day and night. Uh, so if you compare the cost of the transformation with the cost of business as usual, you get into a different picture uh, altogether. And this is why Europe, the Commission has been proposing that the EU should be climate neutral by 2050. Uh, we want to spur other developed countries to do it at the same time or shortly thereafter. We want to be followed in the 2050s and 2060s by the emerging and developing economies. Uh, we see that Japan has started following the same logic, although they have clearly a lesser level of ambition than we have, at least for the moment. Australia may um, be exactly in our position if uh, uh, a new government uh, wins the elections, at least that's what we hear from our Australian friends. New Zealand is in our position. Canada hesitates because you have provinces like Quebec or uh, British Columbia entirely on of our view and others, notably the Prairie provinces in Ontario, much more reluctant. Uh, and the U.S., again, very split. We all know what the Trump administration is saying and doing. Uh, but we also have at least 17 states who have committed 
to maintaining and enhancing the policies that Trump is trying to reverse. We have a massive movement uh, in the cities and local levels uh, in the US, and I see as many American companies as European companies coming to talk about how can we be global citizens and uh, uh, do our part to fight climate change. So the US, with all the difficulties, is far from being a lost cause in, in, in this respect. And even China. China, which has uh, magnified preoccupation in economic development. Let's not forget, in China, there are still 500 million people uh, living in poverty. Uh, never mind that there are 800 million who are either wealthy or okay. There are still 500 million people living in poverty. Uh, still, if China is shown the example, it will follow it. China still makes 70% of its energy out of thermal generation, mostly coal, but it invests in renewables more than everybody else in the world put together. Uh, China just launched an emission trading system uh, whose operation is at the moment limited to the uh, power generation system and it dwarfs the size of the European system. Uh, and they intend to expand it to seven other sectors. So even a country like China, with all the difficulty it has, um, is moving in the same direction as we are, waiting for uh, what we have taken to call leadership by success. If we can show that a model of decarbonized climate neutral society works also uh, in an economically successful way, uh, we will be followed. If we can't show it, then we probably won't be able to apply it even at home, let alone convince anybody else. Um, so what does this long-term strategy actually contain? It's based on a thorough scientific and economic analysis um, we already had the first uh, confirmation, if you like, the, the UK Climate Change Committee, which is an independent body, um, I believe close, similar to the one that you have in Ireland, uh, has produced a massive report which, uh, whose analysis partly coincides, partly overlaps and completes uh, our own. Uh, we've developed eight scenarios. These are not predictions. We don't expect the Europe, Europe to look like any of these scenarios in 2050. But five of these scenarios take one main clean technology and try to push it as much as possible. Let's see what happens if we electrify everything we can think of. Uh, let's see what happens if we replace fossil fuels with decarbonized fuels. Um, none of these scenarios get us to climate neutrality. Then we have some more ambitious scenario where we start combining technologies, and two of these are capable of arriving at net zero. Um, what we wanted to show is not that what Europe is going to look like in 2050. I don't think we, we, we are confident we can. But we wanted to show the doability of certain things, the feasibility of a scenario uh, which leads to uh, net zero, that we have a range of options that we have a range of benefits beyond uh, emission reduction, uh, that we can do it very largely with existing technology. Granted, there's an issue of scalability of some of them, there's an issue of refining them, making them cheaper, easier to operate, but the technologies by and large exist already today, so we're not relying on big, bright new inventions that nobody knows anything about. Um, and in particular, this analysis enables us to compare this with the counterfactual I described earlier. What, what is the real comparison is not with our economy today, but what we have to do in any event, even if we ignore climate change between now and 2050, just to keep our economy ticking, uh, just to keep, to keep ourselves afloat. And then this analysis clearly shows that we can do a net zero scenario and that it is, in most ways, desirable to aim at that objective. It's articulated around seven building blocks. Anybody who's familiar with uh, climate policy will recognize them. Renewable energy, we need to fully decarbonize our energy supply. We expect some countries will want to continue to use nuclear power, but by and large we're talking about renewable sources, about half of them wind. 
uh, energy efficiency, where we have a, a huge store of gains in Europe, especially in the building sectors in terms of renovation. Clean mobility, and clean mobility means going beyond transport. Clean mobility also means public transport. It means rethinking the spatial distribution of the territory in the cities and between cities in the countryside. It means uh, rethinking how much we have encouraged commuting uh, and whether it is in our interest uh, to do so, whether we cannot develop a different model of, of, of spatial management of, of our territory. Industry, energy efficiency, I mentioned that, but it needs to, to go much beyond, it needs technological change. Um, and it needs circular economy, which is not just reducing the need for materials, but also reducing the emissions uh, of the processes uh, to use these materials. Infrastructure, interconnections, in the short term probably more gas pipelines, but will we, what do we transport in, this guy, in these pipelines when we decarbonize our society? Can we reuse them for hydrogen or other decarbonized gases? Uh, electricity, electrical in connection, smart grids, um, then six, the bioeconomy, and seven, as a complement, not as a panacea, not as a solution to all problems, but we will need an element of carbon capture and storage because there are uh, applications that we don't know how to decarbonize. Cement, you can reduce the amount of cement you use. You can make cement less carbon intensive. You cannot make it zero carbon. Um, just to give an example, and uh, biogas, same story. You can make a lot of biogas, but what do you do with the, uh, with the CO2? How are we going to pay for all this? The first thing I'd like to say, this is a question of investment and not of cost. Climate change is a cost, and it's an unavoidable cost. Mitigation, adaptation, resilience are investments to avoid that cost. I think we have to get into this logic if we want to solve this problem. The Commission has brought, the, uh, brought forward a proposal for the next multi-annual financial framework, you know, our seven years European budget, uh, where we have proposed 25% minimum of climate relevant expenditure. Um, Twenty-five percent on average, because there are programs like defense where it's pretty difficult to envisage climate relevant expenditure. Uh, but when it comes to research uh, in different spending programs, we have thirty-five percent, thirty-five percent for the cohesion funds, forty percent for agriculture, uh, etc. Uh, the vulnerabilities uh, that we need to address beginning with European funds, with member state funds, are the same all over. The regions and the sectors which are vulnerable to the kind of transformation we're talking about here are the same which are vulnerable to foreign competition, are the same which are vulnerable to the economic transformation that automation will bring, that 3D printing will bring, that digitization will bring. So in any event, we have an issue that we need to solve. Uh, we need to find the modes, the resources, and the alternatives. Uh, so adding the climate dimension may indeed facilitate, because the green economy in Europe has already produced 4 million jobs, uh, and uh, more uh, can be created. Uh, finally, there is massive private capital available. The question is how to incentivize it. I mean, first we need to define what is a green investment. There's a lot of greenwashing out there. Um, the uh, investment managers are under pressure from their client to, to advise on green investment. What is green? They will need guidance. The insurance industry is beginning to realize that the current policies are going to kill them when the impacts of climate change are going to multiply. They need to build this into uh, their policies in an effective but affordable manner. They also need to know what is the impact they need to protect themselves and their customers against. Um, and third, we need to facilitate 
uh, the use of these funds. Uh, I'll, give you just, I'll give you just one example. Big reservoir of energy efficiency is uh, renovation of old buildings. Not to speak about the Soviet era stock in Eastern Europe, which is in a terrible state. Uh, most individual homeowners do not have access to loans for renovation, not because they can't afford the interest rate, and that you can always subsidize, but because they are considered as an excessive risk by the banks. How do we use public capital to lower the risk profile of those who we think should be financed to renovate their homes? So there's a massive work to be done. The Commission has already put out a number of proposals for a sustainable finance action plan which concentrates on definition and concentrates on how the investment managers operate. But that's only the first step uh, in this. We have to find better ways to make it attractive for private capital to flow into these, uh, uh, these objectives. Very, very last point, the politics of this. Uh, we are, at the moment, discussing this at basically every council that meets. Uh, every European Council has had this on the agenda. Uh, we are touring the, uh, the capitals to have this kind of discussion, to explain what we are doing, what we are proposing, why we are proposing this and something else. Um, we hope to have an endorsement by the European Council. Uh, could be as early as June, could be as late as December. Uh, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that it comes. And on that basis, we can then start working at what policies we need to put in place. The urgent decision to be taken on how we spend our research money, how we spend our infrastructure money. Uh, do we need to deal with regulations like standards for product, build a climate change dimension into how products are built, et cetera, et cetera. It's a massive program, but it will not happen if we don't have a strong top level political direction that agrees whatever happens in 2050, we must be at net zero. Thank you very much. Sorry to be too long. <laughs>